Thank you. Welcome in Klein Yasido, Tom and Hennis. Welcome in Europe. Thank you. What song did we hear, Hennis? Uh, that song there was the friendship song. Um, we use that in all the Iroquois nations, the five nations, uh, which is now the six nations. Um, everybody in the nation knows that song. It's a universal song. The way I know it, um, we sing that song at social times, uh, social gatherings. Um, it, it's sung when uh, to, to raise money for uh, people in need. Tom, you are not the first Mohawks coming to Europe. There's a long history, as I remember, of uh, Iroquois and especially Mohawks to travel to Europe. Probably it was my relatives that were the first ones to come here my direct line of my great 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 grandfather uh, there were three of them that came here to England and they used to call them the three Mohawk kings but of course we don't have kings over there Europe has kings and queens so when they came their leaders so the European call them kings and that's what they're known as but they weren't kings, they were leaders. And one of them was uh, my father's great, 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 great grandfather. So they're direct, some descendant, were direct descendant of them. And so the others that came were also related to them. So it's kind of coincidental that uh, it's our bloodline that we're still coming here. <laughs> and there's other families too that came, but our family was one of them that first came here and continue to come here every once in a while. Yeah. And the purpose of coming was? Well, the first time uh, when they came here, they were, they were trying to uh, find a way uh, that um, friendship could develop and um, be supportive of our life to protect our uh, people. And so um, that's why they came at first. Uh, and then they would come again. And also when, when the United States was formed, uh, there was a, an agreement with the United States that every time there's a, a new president, they're supposed to invite all our leaders to go there to polish the chain of friendship. That's a treaty to renew it every time there's a new, because when there's a new president, the one uh, before has to tell the new one what was the agreements that they have to uphold, because they have to continue the agreements internationally as well as uh, domestically. And so they, they used to ha invite our leaders every time there's a new president. And um, I think the same is true with the monarchs that every time there's another queens or king, they're supposed to uh, renew those as well. And they call it polishing the silver covenant chain. And they use the silver because uh, if you use iron, it rusts. But silver, it, it will only tarnish. And so when the silver chain tarnishes, you have to polish it and it becomes new again, which means they must meet and renew their friendship so they'll always have a good communication. And that's why they come here, is to renew those all the time. And that's partly why we also come to visit too, is to renew that friendship. So you came here not only to renew the friendship, but you also came in a, at the time where we need to have a strong partnership with indigenous people from around the world. So what is the what messages do you carry in your luggage? Well, um, f 
from my understanding of uh, studying all my life about the world and the things that's in the world, I think that um, originally all people at the beginning when the world was new all had a relationship with the earth and as far as I can understand everybody who, who, who is indigenous it doesn't matter if you're Irish or Polish or German or Mohawk or Seneca or Lakota everybody is come from indigenous and in those when the world was new our instruction of how to live as a human being here on the sacred earth was all the same truth how to live here and how to respect the earth and uh, in some parts of the world there are people that still follows those original instructions amongst the native people of North America and South America uh, there are a number of them that still follow that original and and other people did too like in Germany at one time they also had the same instruction based on the universal truth and when I say universal truth what, what am I talking about I'm talking about the Sun because if the Sun goes out everybody's gonna go out no country will survive no tree will survive and no no kids will grow if the Sun stops as a universal truth the wind that blows from the four different direction it's the one that brings comfort when the Sun gets hot in summer bring the gentle breeze to cool us and bring comfort it is also the wind that brings rain when it dries up where we live. It is the wind that brings the rain clouds and makes water to give to the strawberries and raspberries and corn and the trees and the grass and everything that grows. That's another universal truth. Then there's the moon. That's another universal truth. That's why women every month get sick and they purify their blood because the moon is our grandma and determines by every month when women renews their blood in order for a little baby to find a place to grow and to be born. And so the moon is called grandmother because she orchestrates every month all women of the nations of the world to get ready to give birth to the nations. So that's another universal truth. And then the earth, of course, is our mother, the mother of all people, the mother of all trees and things that grow, food and animals and birds. She's the mother of all. Because if she doesn't grow things, we won't have nothing to eat is another universal truth and then there's the water the water was made with mother earth and the creator and the water was instructed by the creation that they will travel down the mountains and through the valleys until they come to the towns and villages of every people and every animal and when the water passes where we live our village they will quench our thirst every day. So everybody as human, we have to drink water. If not, we, won't, we will not live. That's another universal truth. The stars that's in the sky, according to our knowledge, that's where we came from. There's some people, older people said we are star people because our great-grandmother who came from another planet here to earth began human life here according to our teachings so the stars are the one that brings the morning dew on the grass and the dry season of summer 
so life will be always. And the stars are also the ones that guide us. If we get lost at night time, we just look there and it tell us how to get home. So the stars would beautify the universe and send other universal truths. And that's what all our ceremony is about, are the universal truths that support our life. Because if any of those things should cease to operate or exist, it will tip over the world, the balance of the world will stop. But all of those has to be uh, continuing and working. And that's why the nation, Indian nations of North America and indigenous nations of the world that still follow those original truths, that's why they have drums, that's why they have rattles, that's why they have ceremony. So all of those things can be energized and all of those things can harmonize so everything will be fruitful and growing. And when the drums are no longer used, it was prophesied by the old people and those ceremonies do not exist anymore. The sun might stop, the rain might stop, and the wind will be out of control. Nothing will be working in proper harmony. So that's why Hopis and Mohawks and Ojibwe and all indigenous people, they keep on doing their ceremonies so that the kids will have a world to live in, how people will be. How come that the industrial society has forgotten the universal truth and now we are looking to indigenous people to inform us about these losses? What? Well, I, I, I believe, according to some of our elders, the reason they forgot the industrial people is because uh, long ago, they forgot, they, they want not to acknowledge the universal truths uh, because they became greedy and uh, they said they began to have what they call kings and queen and war leaders and, and they fight over resources and material things and they have estates and walls to build walls to protect the kingdoms and the things that they have fought in terms of resources. And so they, they then they changed the universal truth to man-made institutions or organization that would center on humans' need for greed. That's what some of our elders said. And so everybody who has indigenous universal truth, they want them us to forget it because that means we have to share. And so the Iroquois uh, did forget how to do that and we became warlike too for a period of our history as every place in the world did too. So we have similar evolution, similar history. But when we did this, my son was talking about it, that they had begun to kill people too. War leaders began to kill people in the history over 2,000 years ago. And not only that uh, we, our old people kill people long ago when they forgot their ceremonies and how to be a human. Uh, cannibalism also became a practice where you not only kill the people, but you also cook them and eat them. That's what the Mohawk was doing, and the Seneca. But it has been said that the Creator did not like that, that he didn't mean, he didn't intend for us to do that. So he sent a little baby to be born, and that little baby became what they call the peacemaker. And his job, sent by the creation, was to tell the people that the Creator does not condone cannibalism and doesn't condone the taking of other life for no reason. 
and show that Peacemaker did come here in North America to around 2,000 years ago. And he's the one that used his powers and he had miraculous powers. So he had to prove to a warring cannibal people so he had to be tough in terms of, of, of doing miraculous things before their eyes to prove to them that he was representing what the Creator wants, and that's for peace to be in the world. And so he took cannibal people and murderous people, and he was able to convince them to put away their weapons of war and to seek peace and tranquility and harm harmonious ways and to go back to the original teachings that originally was given to us before we forgot those and reinstated all our ceremonies, reinstated our clan system, reinstated our ceremony spiritual, and then we had the great law. Well, the great law of peace that makes you almost to experts in war and peace. Because we had experienced war and cannibalism, and we know that cannibalism and war only brings grief and sadness, especially to the women who bears the children. So when the children's lives are sacrificed, women become more sad because they're the ones that have sacrificed and went through the pain to give birth to the nations. And then the men are the ones that made the warrior societies. It's the, the men are the ones that made us go off the track of what the Creator Mother Earth wants us to do. So that's how come when the peacemaker came, um, he appealed to the women. And, and so when he made a constitution for our Iroquois, he, he gave it to us that we would have a matrilineal. And so he placed the big decisions in the hands of women so that they would uh, initiate who will be the leaders, who will be the religious leaders. And if they don't toe the line correctly, they will initiate the dismissal of those leaders and replace them with people who will support and bring peace to the community. Still today? Still today, the women that's in their hands to make sure uh, that uh, the proper men are put into positions of leadership. Let's look at this process. You have clans and each clan has a clan mother. How does the clan pick the clan mother? Well, the clan comes from your mother and our mother gets their clan from their mother and the grandmother gets the clan from their mother from thousands of years ago. So each clan has thousands of people in each clan. So every clan also are biologically related to each other. It's not just a clan. There actually has a blood, a blood uh, connection to a great, 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 great grandma. So all those descendants are that family and so every Iroquois is born into one of those. There's nobody that's not born into it. So everybody is represented because um, uh, the Mohawk people are just a little different from the Onondagas because Onondaga people has more clan than the Mohawks. We have only three principal clans in the bear, turtle and wolf. But the bear have three kinds of bears. And although they're sister related, they're a different uh, clan. And the same with the wolf. There's a big timber wolf, a white wolf, and a little wolf. That's a wolf clan, so they have three. And um, um, turtle clan too. There's a painted turtle, snapping turtle, mud turtle. 
and they're all their turtle, but they're sister related. So each of those three has one clan mother. And the bear has each one clan mother, but there's three of them. And the wolf too. So that clan mother is the spokesperson for all the descendants in that clan or that political party. So they will have a meeting of their family, that's all the people. And that mother, that woman, can decide if the women will meet by themselves or she, she will initiate by her decision that the men and the women shall meet together or separate to discuss who, who might be the next leaders when one of the leader gets old and that it looks like it's eminent that he's going to pass away they must prepare because no nation should go without leadership for any length of time so that woman will either bring all the men and women together at once or separate and then they will discuss who she and her uh, all her older family suggests they might become leaders politically or spiritually and so what she will do is she will nominate so many men to become political leaders to replace the old chief and that has to be agreed on by all the people in that family and the family consists of a couple thousand people or more and it'll go around counterclockwise first with the women and they first do it and if the men are there then when the women finishes the men they will go around and they also have to agree have to agree to whoever they had nominated and when they all agree and it may take some days to do this but once they receive, uh, reach consensus, everybody has come of one mind. There's no dissenting. There's nobody who's going to be contrary. That's why if it takes several days, they don't mind because it means for many years, there's nobody to make problem. And the candidates, do, have they, do they have a chance to say something as well or do they know that they are on the list or? Sometimes they do and sometimes the, the clan uh, will make sure they're out of town when they discuss about them. I've heard some of my uncles say that the clan mothers would send them to another nation and tell them to organize a lacrosse game, a lacrosse game between the Mohawks and the Seneca. So they sent them those who are going to be possible candidates so they won't hear what they're talking about them. I've heard that. But then other times they, they do let them know. So they, it's up to the women what, what approach they're going to do. But the, the decision, they're not part of the decision. Yeah. They're not asked if, if they will or not. At Tala, the very end, they stand, the woman will stand them up and some, and many times it's a surprise to the person who's going to be the next leader. Doesn't really know until that moment that they're going to install him as a leader. That's at the point where he can say no. He can use allowed to say no. But if he says no, he is saying no to his mother. He's saying no to his grandma. He's saying no to his aunts and uncles. He's saying no to all his nephews and nieces. And so if you say no to your family, that's considered very negative and they, it's okay, but they will never ask you forever after that. You're done. You can continue living, it's, it's okay, but they will never ask him again to be a leader because he said no. How do you get on this secret list of the clan masters? Do they watch the kids already? When, uh, for instance, my uncle one time told me if there was um, 
six kids and little babies, like that little baby they got, that size. They can't walk yet. And they're sitting on the floor and you give them something, toy. And that little kid can't walk. And he holds the toy and the other little kid, he grab it. And so that little boy, he doesn't fight for that toy. He just <coughs> lets him have it. But then the other baby's got the toy, another baby grabs it and they fight and struggle for the same toy. But that one baby did not. He just give it, let him take it. So the clan mothers watch that. Since he was born, he, he's a community minded person. Even he can't walk and already he shares because it's not worth to fight or argue. So he has a quality of a leader at birth. And then they watch those kids as they grow. Do they play good together? Do they argue together? Or do they um, have disagreements? And what, why? They watch that. So if that young boy uh, is always peaceful and when there's an argument between the other kids, he tries to be a referee or tries to stop them from, that means he's like a chief already and he's a little boy. Then as that little boy grows bigger, um, does he help to wash dishes? Does he help the old people when they need wood to keep their house warm in the cold. If they gotta go get water, that little boy, he volunteers to go get water for the older people or for his family without being told, then that's a community-minded person. That's a quality of a leader. When that young boy gets bigger, teenager, does he uh, respect woman and he doesn't abuse woman and when he gets older, guy, and he gets married, and the, the, law, uh, the law says you marry only once, one time, and it's forever until one dies. And I'm supposed to have three kids too. All Iroquois has said that we don't finish our job on earth until we reproduce three kids. <laughs> one to replace the mother, one to replace the father, and one is sent extra by Mother Earth and Creator. In case something happens to the two, there will be another one to replace. And that's the formula of spiritual of the Iroquois. That's what our grandmother told us. So uh, I have six kids. I want to make sure <laughs> I'll make sure I cover everything. Anyway, uh, so then when you get married and you have kids, you don't have another girlfriend someplace else. You stay loyal to the woman and your kids. That's a quality of a leader. And so anybody who does not do this he will be disqualified to be leader. He has to be a family man, a good husband, and loyal to his wife and his kids. And he has to be a good provider, make sure they never are hungry, and they got clothes, they got mugs, and everything that he provides for them, good provider. And not only that, but he also volunteers to provide for the village. And those are the kind of, of people they clan mothers look for. They possess all those qualities. And then when they do put that person up before their whole big family, it's not hard to uh, understand or to come to consensus because everybody knows them to be good. And so the language that we call our leaders for a man leader, we call it Luyane. Luyane. 
And the root word of Luyana means he is good or he is nice. Hmm. And so that's what we call a leader. He who is of the good. That's the interpretation. Mm -hmm. See, it's not chief. Chief is a kind of a downgrading, not not a preferred word. It's more stereotypical American mm. word. Uh, but the, our own language is Luyane. He is good. That's how what it means. And if it's a woman, clan mother, Yakoyane, she is good. And that's the terminology. And the law that governs our constitution is called Gainasla uh, Gowa, means the great goodness. That's the name of our constitution, the great nice or the great good. And the clan masters also have the power to take a chief away from. If he violates any of those things, or if he doesn't follow the law accordingly, she may warn him once she can send one of her nephews to warn him to to mend his ways and he have a chance to fix it and if he doesn't listen the first warning she may send a nephew again and she may go um, with him and talk to him and tell him to fix his ways that he's making a mistake and he has a second chance but if he doesn't adhere to the two chances warnings he, is, he, he has then finally she will send another man over there and that man will take his horn away or his chieftainship or his leadership away from him we call that dehorning that uh, makes it necessary for you to explain why there are horns in your headdresses. Yeah, so on these headdresses, this is a regular people's headdress, the kind we have. But if it's a leader, then the women put deer horns on there. So when you see this with a deer horn, you know it is one of the condoled official leaders of the nation. So when they, if they don't behave themselves, the leader, that the women will send the men to remove the horns from their hat or their head. And if that happens, they call that part of a constitution when somebody was dehorned. It's one of the most disgraceful things or shameful things that can happen. And they say, if, they, if you get your horns removed, or it was adopted later by the American government called impeachment, mm -hmm. but it's an original Iroquois law. law. And so when they dehorn a, a leader, they say you're not supposed to listen to them anymore. You're not supposed to adhere to anything they say because the, the blood is dripping from the horn de, being uh, severed from his head. So the blood goes in his eyes. So he does not know how to see the future where he's, he can't lead the people to the future because blood is blind in him. What does do the horn symbolize? They say that the reason the deers has a horns is it's like a radar. It's like a inbuilt radar in there. It's like a snake uses tongue and he, he can see and see images through the tongue. And the same with the deer. Our old people says that the deer is like a radar, and so it, it, it catches any movement or any danger around, and uh, it is forewarned so they can scamper away from danger. And so that's why our leaders, they, the women put horns on the, their head so that they will also have this extra power of the deer so that they may protect their village and their nation from any possible danger coming, like a deer does. So you were a chief of the, or a loyal of the no, Bear Clan? No, no, no. People think that. Because uh, the reason people think that is because there was an older man that was, uh, he was a leader called 
um, the Hanak Galine, that she's title of that that leadership, the Hanak Galina Bear Clan, which is my family. And he was 97 years old. And he had been a leader for over 60 years. And when he became older, he couldn't hear good. And mostly couldn't hear good. So in our law, of the traditional law, it said if your health impaired of any way, uh, deaf or blind or some, or health-wise impaired, that uh, you, you, you can't sit in a council because you have to be able to hear because you have to lead a nation. You have to be able to have a good sight so that because you got to see for the nation. You have to have a good thinking. You can't have Alzheimer's because uh, you have to think for the benefit of all your kids and all your people. So when he became deaf, they put me as his ears. They call it a bench warmer. So I was never a chief, but I sat in substitute for the real chief for over 25 years. He lived that long, but he was deaf. So whenever decision were made, I sit there for him. And when the decision is over, I go to his house and I tell him what was discussed and what happened. And he says, okay. And so that's how it works. But because I was sitting there for him for 25 years, many of my own people at my my home, they think they thought I was a chief because they see me there for 25 years. And uh, I was never a chief. But people, I took the place of a chief, but I was never officially that. I was a helper. That still happens that you have helpers sitting in the long yeah, house. Yeah, but I'm not anymore because uh, when I had a big heart attack, 27 years, 28 years ago, the clan mothers released me, which they don't usually do that. But because I, because of the political things, the doctor said no more stress like that. If, if, if you don't, you're gonna die. So the clan mothers and them had a meeting and they said, we don't want you to die. So we're gonna take it away. But, um, but whenever they need help, they come to me to seek our advice. Or if there's a ceremony they need help, I help them. So I'm still there for the people, but not in the like in the deep, stressful parts. I would like to return to your confederacy, the highest in your hierarchy, which is not the wrong, it's the wrong word, but on top is the Tato Daho. And I'm always moved by the fact of his history and that you still uh, keep this name alive. So. Uh, maybe you can tell the story how this came all about. Well, it's part of what you might call psychology. They practice kind of a big psychology. I, I don't know if that's the right word, but I think it is. Uh, Tarudaho means, uh, in, in English, if you translate the word Tarudaho, it means like if, you, if we're all here, we all agree, but one man, he don't agree. Or we all say we're gonna do this, but that one man, I'm not gonna do it. So he always obstructs. He always uh, stop everything. He don't never agree. That's what his name means. He stops it or obstructs things. I thought it means growing snakes no. from your hair. No, no, no. It means he's the obstructor. He doesn't agree with the people. He wants to be the ruler. Mm -hmm. He wants to be the boss, the authority, like a king. And he also was a man that was so self-conceited, I guess, that nobody, he can't live with nobody. Almost like Trump, like, like uh, they talk about Trump, he, like, uh, what's the word they call Trump? He's, uh, he has to glorify himself all the time. 
for turned off or something like that. So he can't live with anybody, can't stand him. And he can't stand people either. So he lived in the swamps by himself because nobody could get along with him. He was always blowing his own horn or trying to be the, the last say and the say of everything. And also he had power too. He, he was able to have supernatural power. So he was so much wanting to control everything that he would use these powers uh, and he could even cause a tornado to come or a hurricane to come. He could to do those things. And he could also uh, rattlesnake or wolf or anything were his friends too, good friends. And so they would watch everything where he lives in a swamp and the, and the crows too. If anything came there next to him, they would tell him right away. So he would control the weather, control the wind. So if somebody tried to cross the lake to go where he lives, the wind would come and the waves would get big and turn your boat over and you can't get there. So he had those kind of powers. And uh, so he wanted to be the, the boss. So that's why when the peacemaker came who brought the constitution and whose job was to convince them to do the ways of peace, not war, they didn't go see him because they were just starting to, to become united. So he went to the Mohawks first, they tested him and the Mohawks were real cruel to test them, but he survived all their tests. And that's why the Mohawks believed him, because he proved to them that he had a power from the Creator to survive those tests. Then the Oneidas were easier. Uh, they didn't test him like we did, the Mohawks. And so they accepted. But he skipped Anadagas, that were the next, the way the sun goes, because of Tararaho. They didn't want to go there because he was powerful. They were not strong enough yet. So they skipped Onondaga and they went to Cayuga. And the Cayugas joined the peace way, movement of peace. And then they went to the Seneca. And the Seneca had trouble, with, they gave them trouble. But the Seneca also were very powerful people. And they said they don't need no peace. That they, they, they have enough men to control anybody who bothers them. They don't need nobody. And so they, they had to um, have the extra work by the peacemaker to convince them. Mm -hmm. So the Seneca uh, said that they're not gonna do peace and get, get rid of their warrior chiefs because if somebody came to bother them and they bury their weapons of war, they have nothing to defend themselves. So they said, we, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna quit the war leader. So they compromised with the Seneca. And so there's two titles, it's a war title, that became a chief title. So if the Iroquois nations, they're the only ones that has a war leaders. So if any of the other Iroquois nation has to go to war, has to defend herself. It has to come through those two Seneca war leaders. They're the only peace leaders that can open the door to war if it's if it becomes there. But that's the very, very last resort. And it's way it still is today. They're they're in Seneca country, them too. But they're not war leaders but they have the potential to to redo that kind of a way if it's necessary. So then the Senecas agreed. So now all of the four nations are united. So now they're gonna go see Tardahu, the one that can make hurricane and tornado, and who's a big, uh, almost like a witchcraft. 
and they said he was such evil that his skin was like a scale of a fish and he had crooked arms and legs there were seven crooked that broken places in his body and uh, he was a loner guy he can't live with nobody he just lived with the bears and the wolves and rattlesnake and that and that uh, his hair was all matted up and in his hair lived snakes living snakes rattlesnake live in his hair so if you ever go next to him that snake starts to go like they're ready to bite you because they protect him and uh, he could cause a lightning too just he could he, he knew how to do all that but so does the other people too but not as much as him he was the master of it so when all of them went over there to where he lives they have to be careful because he did make the hurricane come and when they went on canoes big waves came and it capsized their canoes up when they drowned but they were able to save themselves because the peacemaker also had power so he calmed the waters down and all that but there was a, a like a contest going on so they got over there to Cicero swamp and uh, he, he was forewarned by the crows and all the different animals so the peacemaker said uh, to Ehuata you have to sing this song called the peace song but don't hesitate in your song and if you cannot hesitate or have a reluctance of your song it's consistent then Tarodaho's power will not find a door to, to come into us and, and ruin our visitation to him. So they say Enwata got nervous and he hesitated. Almost Tardaho was able to stop them because so then the peacemaker took over and he sang that song. They got right to him and them snakes were going like this hissing because they were all mad and all his, his power was mad because he couldn't stop them because they were united and they had the peacemaker. So they took the woman named Jagung Sase. She was, uh, they, some people say she was from the neutral Indian. There are now no more of them. And uh, she's the first one that heard the recital of the great law. And, uh, but she didn't want it at first either. And she, she tried to trick and kill the peacemaker. But when she no, noticed that she couldn't trick him, his power was more than her, because she also had power. Then she gave up and she endorsed the peace plan. And so the peacemaker then made her the symbolic clan mother of all the Iroquois. So she was part of the group who went to Onondaga. Went to Onondaga. And, and, they, and she used her power, and they, she, she used their power with the peacemaker. And they uh, took all the fish scale off of his skin and returned it to normal skin. And they worked on his body and they took all the crooked parts and they straightened it up to be a human again. And then Jagun Saze and that delegation, a peacemaker, began to sing and the snakes fell out of his hair and they groomed his hair and they took the mats out of it and he became a, like a human again. But still he was not agreeable. So the Anadagas have the smallest population, Mohawk, way bigger than Anadaga. 
Seneca, way bigger. Cayugas, bigger. Oneidas, bigger. They have the smallest people, Anadagas. But the Mohawks only has nine leaders. Cayugas have ten. Oneidas have nine. Seneca has eight. Anadaga, the smallest, has fourteen. And he promised them fourteen leader more than all the other nation, and they're the smallest because he used psychology. Because in the law, all 50 chiefs has to be consensus before it becomes a law. So it doesn't matter if you got more chief or you only got one chief, that one chief, if he says no, they can't pass it. So numbers don't mean nothing because you gotta become one mind. You do follow. And that's what they did. And then they told Tarudaho, because he was so used to being the authority, he can't let that go hardly. So the peacemaker told him, you will, you will be the Tarudaho of all the whole five nations. You will be the fire keeper for all, the great fire keeper. But in the Constitution it says, although he is like the head of all the chiefs, he doesn't have more power than any of them. That they're all equal. Even though his name, he, he's the Tadraho. It's like the Queen of England in Canada or in Great Britain. She's the Queen, the head of state, but she don't have no power. And that's what the Hamza talked about, and he agreed that. Well, the ki and kids grow up with this name, talking about the Tatu Daho, so that keeps also the the, the story alive. Yeah, how it all came about. Yes. Yeah, but so he was a very evil man, a very very bad man, but they were able to transform his evilness for good. And so were those other chiefs. They were war leaders, and they used to be cannibals. But he convinced them to stop that, that evil way of destruction and murder and cannibalism. And then they all became leaders and good leaders. So what it means is that all people in the world has a chance to, to go away from evil and bad practice to good things for their nation. So if we go into today's world, we had, we had Saddam, who was almost described like Tatahutaho yeah. or the Gaddafi. I mean, the, the world always has a number one bad guy. Mm -hmm. And how would you deal with those people in your tradition, in your ways? Or how would you uh, analyze our diplomacy, which is no, not a diplomacy, how we deal with uh, people who do not fit. Well, we would use the same strategy as the peacemaker used. So Gaddafi and, and Trump and all those kind of people, they, they uh, think that they're really special people. What's the word they use for that? It's a sickness. Egomaniac. <laughs> yeah, something like that, but it's another word, narcissistic, Narciss yeah. narcissistic people. Um, that's a, it's a, like a sickness, huh? So, so if it's a sickness, it's treatable. There's a therapy for it. So you use psychology. That's what they used on Talaraho. So they he he wants to be important. So they said he will be the head, but he doesn't have more power than anybody. And so they were able to use the psychology, and he accepted that because he does have a big name, but his power isn't any more than any of the other chief. And that's how you would approach it. Well, since I would call you experts in war and peace, are you ever, are the Haudenosaunee ever being consulted in, in issues of crisis? <coughs> Since you 
have this long history of dealing with conflict? Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you. Do you remember in Egypt when they had that, uh, what did they call that in Egypt? The, the, the Arab Spring. Yeah, say it again. Arab Spring. Arab Spring. Arab Spring. Okay, now Egypt had a big demonstration to get rid of their uh, leader there. And now they're going to try to put something else in there. I got a call from somebody, I can't remember who it was. And they wanted to know, I think it was from Egypt too. They wanted to know about the Great Law. So I mentioned it to some of our leaders, but it went over their head. They, so what was being sort of requested, they wanted to know if somebody uh, could explain the great law to them because they want to entertain a new law, a new government over there. That would have been a prime opportune time had the Confederacy been together enough. They could have sent a delegation over there. But they're not ready for that yet because they're still in the healing process. They're the not. He healing process of what? what? Well, from the history, they were colonized so much and uh, um, uh, what do you call it? residential school era uh, is I think five generations went there which undermine our whole tradition, our whole value, our whole teachings. Uh, although we have it fragmented, almost all of it, yet it's fragmented. It's a matter of, of gathering it back and putting it together and then becoming accustomed to it and its practice. We're not ready that yet. See, we're still trying to get ourselves back together after colonization. So when that call came from Egypt, uh, I'm ready to go there to help them, but they weren't ready to, to, they were still not sure. So they didn't heed that, which is a pity. It really is. Yeah. And I tell my chiefs too, uh, whenever I get a chance, that wherever there's troubled places in the world, we should be sending our peace ambassadors there with the same message that the peacemaker brought to us so that they might do something similar and there will peace start to come all over the world. But we're not ready, the Iroquois not ready yet because we're still licking our wounds, our scars from what happened to us I don't know when we're going to be ready because colonization is one of the most deadliest, most effective, uh, crippling thing that can happen to a people. It takes so long. It's like a, a drug addict or a alcoholic. Mm. They never cure. They say, they themselves say, you can't never say, I'm sober now forever because you don't know tomorrow you can fall back to become alcohol or drug addict again. Although even for 10 years, they may not have touched alcohol or drug, but all of a sudden, tomorrow, they can be on there again. So it's a sickness that, that resurrects itself, and it's very scary. So that's the way colonization is too. Uh, but you see hope? I do. Mm -hmm. I see the hope in the young people. Mm -hmm. Let us talk a little bit about this concept of the seventh generation, because uh, we have uh, a lot of discussions here to have a way of life which is uh, not harmful, uh, nachhaltig, sustainable, and, uh, and I think uh, this is where we could meet. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the constitution that the peacemaker brought, I always say 2,000, but I don't know if it is 2,000. But some guy told me it was, it has to be at least 2,000 years old. And I like that. He told me, don't say 1,000 years ago. He says, that's the, that's the uh, colonizational uh, 
Well, even they say 500 years 500 ago. 500 years ago, yeah. But, uh, but beyond 1,000, he says, there be more than that. In order to accomplish what the peacemaker did, there's no way it can be done in that little, little time. So some really academic people told me that, that, that they can pretty scientifically figure that out. I don't know how, but that's what they told me. So I believe it. Because they said, if we say 1,000, we're, we're downgrading our history. So it doesn't make no difference anyways. It was a long time ago. <laughs> In that constitution that the peacemaker brought, he said that, that, that the leaders, the, the leaders, political leaders, that would be the men and the women of our people, that when they sit down to make a law for the people, that what, whatever you do today, the decision you make today is, is, not, is not a decision just for you. But the decision that you will make today has got to be guaranteed and put deep thought in it that the law you make today will not hurt or injure seven generations from you that your children grandchildren and great great grandchildren when they're born what you did decide today won't hurt them so whenever you counsel every law you make has to have them in mind that's how far you have to think and that's part of the constitution of the peacemaker which is pretty good because we don't make a law for our immediate today. Well, we have an environmental movement. We have in Germany, for example, we have a ministry for the environment. We have a minister for environment, but it's always from uh, the, the humans are in the center and we are dealing with nature as something which is there for us to be used. But there is no equal understanding or, I mean, mm, a lot of people would smile about the idea that plants are intelligent, but all of a sudden there are scientists telling us plants have in intelligence. So, and then Two years ago, a river of the Maori in New Zealand got legal standing in court. So there is a change. So I would like you to comment on, on the times we are in, on this shift. Well, that goes, I think, back to colonization uh, in the world, that way back, when uh, I think religions were invented by men, they put man as the center instead of a part of the environment. So that they can use the sacred things for greed and for manipulation and that's the whole system that's ruling the world today. And all the people, we have been herded into that mentality so that we don't argue it. We just think that that's the, the way it's supposed to be. But um, I have heard uh, elders say in regards to the environment or the waters or the sun or the environment that we live in that um, humans are not even close to be in the center of our life at all. In fact, we are probably the least important of all life. I've heard elders say many times already that 
if there were no humans living here, the trees are still gonna live. The buffalo is still gonna live. The frog is still gonna live. They don't need us. And if we were not here, they won't, they won't miss us I bit, one bit. They won't even make a dent in them. In fact, they'll probably be better off if we're not here. So it's completely opposite of what uh, the uh, structure of the world powers telling us that we're, we're the center of everything, where we're not. We're dependent on everything, not the other way around. So, so eventually, if the humans don't change and recognize that, then, then that whole universe will deal with us. And it means death for ma masses of people. So modesty is requested. Yeah, so we have to, so that's why I myself, I push the indigenous knowledge, whether it's Maori, whether it's African, whether it's German, uh, indigenous, to go back to those, because that's where our commonality will be. Because I know with the Lakota, they're a Native American, but they're different than the Mohawks. And I know the Hopi, they have Kibas, and they're different than the Mohawks, but they have a sun dance, the Lakota, the Hopi and the Iroquois. And it's all different, but it's all for the sun. They have thunder dance too, and it's all different with each of them, but it's all for the thunder. So corn and food can grow. And I'm sure that if I ask for the indigenous German, when there was an indigenous German, they will have a thunder dance too. They will have a sun dance too. But it's just that colonization happened here long ago before Lakota and before Navajo or Hopi or Mohawk colonization happened. The colonization occurred here thousand years before us. So in our DNA, for the Iroquois and, and the indigenous people of North America, it's still in our DNA only 200 years ago when it was disrupted. Whereas Europe, it was disrupted a couple thousand or 3,000 years. So it's further in the DNA down. So got to dig a little deeper, if you, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Us, it's not too hard because mm -hmm. it's just almost under the surface. It's still difficult. But for those that lasted 2,000, it's further in the memory. But then again, that may also have its advantage because 2,000 years of being removed from the truth creates a desire more than, than for us who had just lost it. Because us, we're not used to the luxury yet. So we're, we're just basking in the sun of luxury because mm. we never had before. Until we get over that, then we, then we will want to desire something more important. But right now, the superficialness of the glamour of modernization is, is still we're in the glitter of it, the Indian people. But for Europe, they've been through this for 2,000 years. They might be more ready for it. So there's all different ways to look at it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure when it's ready or not ready, but I know in my own evolution, I'm ready uh, to listen, I'm ready to help or to be used or to whatever it takes. Where can I fit? Where can I help the process? If uh, there is any such thing. So you travel to, your, your trip to Europe starts here in Klein Yasido, in the community who produces the Oya magazine. 
and um, now you will travel through Germany, Austria, northern Italy, and then to the Netherlands. What do you want to achieve on this trip? Or is achieve maybe the wrong term for it? Yeah, I think uh, it would be probably the wrong term, I think. Mostly it's, it's uh, I would say, over the years, like I said last night, uh, different European delegation or people, or segments of European people, has understood our struggles and have helped us politically and academically through our schools, our Freedom School, and things over the years. And um, so one of my purposes was just to just to let the, the people in these countries know that we really appreciate that, what they have done for us. Because that is part of helping us wake up and re realizing that we were colonized and some of them told us that too. And that's what made us realize that it is true. And so now that we have come to that realization, now we can begin to recognize what the problem is and how might we fix it. And so that's why we're here, is to say thank you. And also uh, the way we were raised in this struggle, in this confusion, we still have those indigenous teachings that is, is still kind of fresh yet. And we, and we thought if we share some of those, it might also shed some light on things that were indigenous here. And then it will float up top again and be embraced. And then therefore, those factors that would unify everybody in a common uh, orchestration of effort might bring a better harmony to the world. So it's a Mother Earth alliance we are. Yes, that's what I think. Uh, in, yeah. in and it's to create friendship and friendship then creates trust because you can't do anything if you don't trust. Okay. I'll sing another verse of the friendship song. song is uh, the reason they do that is the men or the women when we get visitors the men will go get the uh, woman that's visiting and the men will go get the, no the men will go get the woman that's visiting and the woman will go get the men that's visiting and partner with them to break the ice 
to have a dance to be friends. That's what that's for. It's a slower dance, so it's easy to do it. I remember when Mario Capanna was in the Aquisas in the Longhouse, and we were, it was a, a stomp dance, and he said, Ich tanze wie ein Essel. I dance like a donkey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. I well, mean, thank you too. I mean, knowing that you had to condense your stories, you know, uh, you, yeah, it's great that we were doing this in this short time. But uh, it's yeah. That's a real truth, though. They did. We did get a call. I got the call from Egypt. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, it's always in my mind how c it's what a waste of knowledge and experience because you could give the whole diplomacy in the world is kind of rotten and it's based on nuclear power, you know, mm -hmm. an old-fashioned defense system, you know. I mean. I'm, I think it's only kept alive because it fits into the, into the rivalry and the power manifestation. But when it comes to weapons, I think they have much more sophisticated weapons to control and to like stop communication or, uh, I mean, you, we don't need nuclear weapons uh, to, uh, to have a, a winner because if, if used, there are no winners. So it's old, an, 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 an old structure of thinking, and you could add a new imp give a new impulse with your very ancient experience. So, getting a call from Egypt is exactly what I often think about. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I try to tell our, some of our elder people too, because uh, uh, some of their knowledge has been warped by hurt and distrust. Mm. So they have like a clam, they, they go back in a shell. Yeah. Because, well, it, it stands to reason because they used to be punished for, for doing that and believing that. So they were punished, some of them were put in jail too. So that's why they're like that. So I guess we have to allow them that time to do that, but there's a time when you gotta get out of that and start exercising. And that's where sort of we're trying to be at now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was a great interview. I enjoyed it very <laughs> much. Yeah. Great.